How would you describe yourself? For me? I don't think I know. There's a lot that goes into a person, and I don't think I have an objective view of myself. I don't think anyone does. Most of us have been asked this at some point, and inevitably, your mind goes blank. Are you loyal? Caring? What are your values? It's hard to boil down a whole person to a quickfire list, but every so often in life, it's good to stop and check in. Who am I? Who do I want to be? The worst one is the classic job interview question. How would other people describe you? I don't know. Which other people specifically? Friends? Family? Colleagues? I'm not any of those people. I'm me. At our core, we all have a set of values which we express in different ways depending on the situation. They'll have different emphasis depending on where you are and what you're doing, but they'll always influence your actions. Having to pit those values against each other sharpens them, hardens them, refines them, and forces you to think about why they're important. It makes you grow and change and think more carefully about why you care about something like honesty or loyalty. It reaffirms them and makes them more solid. If you want to stand by a friend and protect them from something, while also being scrupulously honest, that might not work out as well as you'd hope. People are messy. But we all see ourselves as the main character most of the time. It's your own point of view you see the world through after all. You can't be constantly watching yourself over your shoulder. But it's good to question who you are and what you want every so often. You might feel one way, but how do you actually come across? How does that translate into your words and behaviour? And some of the most interesting stories to me are the ones where the character's perspective doesn't match up with the audience's at all. Who am I? Part 1. Self-conception Jennifer, Jennifer, play with me Jennifer. Read the story. Please, read the story. Machines are binary. They're logical. They thrive on raw data and do exactly what they're instructed to with it. Humans... aren't. In order to make sense of or remember raw data, we need to establish some kind of pattern that it follows. Some kind of story. But sometimes, something breaks our familiar pattern. Sometimes we can't make sense of a piece of information. It doesn't fit the story, and so we either warp it until it fits, open up a new, shaky pattern, or reject it and forget it. There's even a phenomenon in psychology called narrativization, where humans impose story logic onto the real world, expecting it to follow a standard plot. We already have the blueprint ready to go. There was even a movement in Western classical music during the 19th and 20th century called Impressionism, which uses suggestive details and unresolved chords which trail off like an ellipsis, allowing the listener to fill in the gaps themselves and choose their own impression. It relies on the person listening to have those blueprints, and this is how memory and stories work too. But sometimes we don't have those blueprints, and information can't be either taken in or rejected. Sometimes something traumatic happens. It's deeply emotionally formative, but those emotions can't all be processed at once, and maybe you can't make sense of what happened. This is where repressed memories and trauma-induced amnesia comes in. This is where Rule of Rose comes in. Rule of Rose is a 2006 psychological horror game, which is banned in multiple countries, and over time has become one of the rarest video games of its time, and later became a cult classic. It is, also, my absolute favourite game. It's jam-packed with metaphors, fairy tales, and children with very little idea of what normal is. Their perspectives all make sense to them individually, and they act consistently with what they believe. But out of context, a lot of it seems strange to the point of intimidating. The main perspective we get is that of our protagonist, the gloomy 19-year-old Jennifer, returning to the orphanage she spent a traumatic year in growing up. She's timid and shy, and reverts back to her old anxious self as she hurries through the corridors, curling in and hoping not to draw any of her bullies' attention. The whole setting is off-kilter from the start, to tip off the audience that we shouldn't be taking this literally. Jennifer's dropped off in a country lane in the middle of the night, following a strange boy demanding that she tell him a story from a book that slowly fills itself in the more she remembers. She's a dissociative amnesiac, working through all of her trauma and making her own life into a story to make it less painful to connect to, 
and so there's several game chapters that correspond to months spent in the orphanage that you can access out of order if you like. The narrative throughline is scrambled. Even the linear chapters have events that occur with non-linear consequences. The housekeeper may have died an hour in, but she'll be very much alive again, if bound and gagged, a few hours later. Time's just like that sometimes. D don't worry about it. As Jennifer follows the strange boy demanding a story, she finds a doll of herself tied to a pillar inside the abandoned orphanage, its head slumping in defeat. The doll and Jennifer alike are trapped here for the other kids to play with, not the other way around. She's not a person to them, and she will be at their mercy. But there are no kids here anymore. It's empty, yet there are still the telltale signs that children live here. A train track scribbled onto the floor, giggles coming from the dark and the feeling of many eyes watching doors slammed by a masked little boy. When Jennifer's directed to the courtyard, there's a grave marker and the promise of a funeral for her dear friend. She can't control the urge to dig up the grave, sensing that something precious to her is down there and digs frantically, compulsively. But just as she's about to confront whatever's in the coffin, she's surrounded by masked children. They ritually cleanse her, pouring water on her adult self and calling her filthy. It's the death of the self, it's breaking Jennifer down and washing away everything that's happened since her childhood, cleansing her and shoving her into the open grave, hoisting up the coffin chanting ashes to ashes, dust to dust. She's carried back into a distorted, dreamlike past so that she can remember and rebuild herself anew. Jennifer wakes up tied to a pillar in a distorted version of the room with the doll, this time with Jennifer in its place. A warning. There's an obvious helplessness here, as Jennifer sits with the lack of resistance of the floppy rag doll, stuffed with discarded cloth. There's no spine there, no support or firmness, which mirrors both Jennifer's physical frailty after the airship crash that orphaned her, but also her weak will. She was too frightened to stand up to her bullies until things were taken beyond too far, past criminal and into a horror story. She was too weak. And this isn't a judgement on my part. This is how she feels about her past self before she can really come to terms with her, and so this is the image her mind creates. The whole point of Jennifer's journey is to reconcile those old feelings with her adult self, and view them for what they truly are. All she has is a collection of jumbled memories, unhappy at best and deeply traumatic at worst, and she's trying to make sense of that raw data. She's trying to find the pattern, the story. But this warning of the ragdoll does seem to have sparked a tiny change in her adult self, as you can't proceed unless you struggle. The narration that begins the next section will not start unless you force Jennifer to move, to strain against the ropes holding her in this vulnerable position. You have to try to move forward. The narration constantly calls her frightened and helpless, and the in-game storybook which tells her life calls her the unlucky girl. If there's this filter, this separation, then it's not really Jennifer's story. It's the unlucky girl's. She's very much aware that this girl is her, but it puts a bit of softening distance between the two. The girls of the orphanage have created a little aristocracy, which determines a hierarchy, and every aristocrat we meet is given a title by the in-game narration too. Jennifer isn't the one personally narrating, the story she's telling herself is. In her mind, the uncharitable interpretation is that of a weak, spineless child who let others walk all over her, and so here she is, alone dirty, and not even able to be loved amongst children who'd suffered in the same way she did. A filthy wretch. Oh, what an unlucky girl. The airship we find ourselves on is shaped like a fish, much like the fish the kids have seen in their headmaster's tank, swimming above a model of the orphanage it mirrors. This fish swims through the sky to freedom, and Jennifer's along for the ride now too. No nice easy doors to unlock and run away through. She's trapped. And while most of the airship is fairly plain and looks to be purely for utility, like an underfunded rural orphanage in 1930, say, the most lavishly decorated place belongs to the Red Crayon Aristocrats. Every girl has the title of princess, but the subsequent trait is always negative, usually the thing that Jennifer feared most about them. Most of these don't paint them as actively hostile, like the rude princess or the biting princess, but they're always something that would be used against a younger and more cowardly Jennifer. It's not what they do, it's what they are. The strong-willed princess, for instance, would give orders to torment her and control the other girls around her, sitting proudly at the top of the pecking order. The cold princess was frightening, as Jennifer could never tell what she was feeling, and therefore, 
what she might do. The wise-looking princess always knew too much, and used the other children to spread rumours about her, and was always whispering in the strong-willed princess's ear, desperate for her approval. The titles presented to us from Jennifer's point of view paints a very particular picture of each of the girls. How the story frames them, how Jennifer frames them, emphasises some traits and minimises others. Jennifer only sees Diana as the strong-willed Queen Bee, but the player who can read between the lines can see the places where Diana shows weakness, fear and insecurity, and in those moments asserts herself even more strongly at the top of the pecking order. And when I say pecking order, I really mean it. The girls here have ranked themselves in the manner of an aristocracy, princess, duchess, countess and baroness being the high-class children, with the rest below as the bourgeoisie. But if there are elites, then there must be a lower class to feel superior to. If you're not careful, you can sink down to the lower class, but there are ways to rise up too. There must always be a lower class though, and they don't like Jennifer, so they immediately place her at the rank of beggar. As beggar, Jennifer is encouraged to compete with the other low-class girl, the small-hearted princess, for the chance to win the favour of the Red Crayon Aristocrat Club and join their ranks. The aristocrats don't allow there to be any sense of solidarity or community, or the system wouldn't work. There's only the drive to climb to the top and stay at the top. And for a deeper dive into that concept, take a look at my Arcane video. You can probably imagine by the title, The Small-Hearted Princess, that she's not the most reliable girl to call a friend. It's not that she's necessarily a bad person, but she's selfish by necessity and desperately needs to be loved and craves the approval of the girls who are higher rank than her. This, of course, means that she can't let Jennifer surpass her, even though she desperately wants her as an ally against the other girls. They're in the same boat, they should look out for each other. And there's always the security of not being in last place anymore. Even her name, Amanda, means worthy of love, as she does everything she's asked of and more with enthusiasm, but she can't see that her role in this game is to compete with Jennifer endlessly. The other girls have no intention of letting either of them rise any higher, when they can just set them against each other. But Amanda doesn't want to see the bigger picture, because it hurts. It goes against her own inner narrative, built of coping mechanisms that allow her to see the world in a way she can deal with. While all of these princess titles exist solely within Jennifer's inner narrative, the other girls can clearly see where they fall in the social hierarchy, and they'll do anything not to be demoted. Their rankings are pinned up in pride of place on the wall, and examining them makes the camera pan slowly down, encouraging you to drink in the majesty and cruelty of the aristocrats. You can't give it a quick glance, you're forced to linger and really consider your place in the story. Of course, they're just children in a rundown orphanage in 1930, in the midst of the Great Depression as the world was still recovering from World War I. They aren't aristocrats, and this social system is all just made up, arguably like any social system. It gives them purpose though, and the chance to pretend that they have power and control in their lives. They're not cast off orphans shoved out of sight, they're important. All of the children are trying to work out where they stand with each other like any social group, just in a more… upfront way. <laughs> Obviously, this creates a breeding ground for bullying and marks all the lowest ranked children as free-for-all targets, which uh, not good! Very not good! But they're all orphans. They're trying to work out how to love and be loved while dealing with losing their families. To enter the club at all, you have to swear the Rule of Rose, an oath of love, to the princess and the club itself. You have to choose to love and pledge your whole self to this game, and then, thanks to that loyalty, you have to severely punish kids who fail to offer their princess a good enough gift every month. You have to hurt your friends when something precious to them is chosen as the gift. You have to lie, manipulate, humiliate. Well, you don't want to be the one at the bottom, do you? You've seen how they get treated. All the enemies Jennifer faces, yes there is combat in this game, no it's not good, are imps. Grotesque little creatures with huge, mismatched, empty eye sockets. Small and hunched, they come after children who don't clean up and do their chores. There's a huge emphasis on cleanliness and filth in this game, with Jennifer living in the filth room, and earning the rank filthy when she inevitably fails to measure up to the other children's standards. Filthy wretch. Like I said, a lot of what we see is twisted through Jennifer's framing of events, and while it's likely that the other children did once pour water on her when calling her names, I doubt they pushed her into a grave. 
but her mind immediately reproduces that as her first encounter with the children, making her the lowest of the low again as she's shoved back into her own past. Even though in-game she hasn't been given that room yet or granted that title again, her subconscious remembers. It was her identity. And it's only the filth room, because filthy Jennifer lives there, a quiet girl who might get a bit grubby from washing everyone's clothes as that was her assigned chore, and those clothes get dumped in the laundry, or filth room. And of course, as an outcast, she tends to play outside in the fields and muck away from the other children, eventually finding and adopting a puppy. The faces of those enemy imps are distorted with muffled voices, because Jennifer remembers being terrified on Halloween when everyone made masks out of paper bags with mismatched eye holes torn into them. She says that she was afraid it wasn't really the other children under there, and kept asking if it really was, but got no response. The imps usually appear in big groups, trying to overwhelm her, probably to represent the way the other children overwhelmed her when they ganged up on her as a child. Even their voices are whispery and muffled, but in the final chapter we finally get to hear what they're saying. A bright red crayon just for you, taunting her with the offer and threat of becoming an aristocrat. Something I find really telling and characterful is that the combat in this game is bad. The hitboxes are terrible. You don't have a health bar or heads up display and have to rely on how much she's limping. You barely do any damage, if you can even hit them. That makes for a bad game experience, but it's an amazing story experience. When Jennifer tries to fight back, she hunches in on herself, not wanting to fight, not wanting to be seen. If you chain attacks, she'll even cover her eyes, shielding her face as she wildly swings a dessert fork into the dark. She doesn't even speak much throughout the game, even when the other girls are bullying her, and instead mostly gasps, whimpers, and cries. Jennifer is… not a fighter. Each chapter focuses around another child's story, and the imps that appear have animal heads corresponding to whichever animal Jennifer associates with them, just like those scribbled on paper bags at the beginning. Everything is deeply coded, every girl having a rank, a title, an animal. Jennifer is desperately trying to make everything make sense, trying to force it into a narrative she can understand. It makes the children feel one-dimensional at first, until you've found your feet and can dig around more. And that's the entire point. She needs some way into this mess, a foothold, something tangible. And the longer this story goes on, the more creaks and groans you can hear from the airship. Everything here is physically strained, and more ropes get wound around the structural supports, trying to hold everything together as the girls' relationships become increasingly frayed as they turn on each other. The ropes may also represent entrapment and constriction, as the longer the children's games go on, the more trapped Jennifer feels. There's nobody coming to her rescue. Her being brought to the orphanage was the rescue. And I'm not going to spoil the main plot here, as I do intend to write a big video on this game one day. But I'm going to talk about the extra chapter after the good ending, because the resolution of Jennifer's story is what makes wading through all the children's psychological torture games mean something. Once Jennifer's unpacked all of the trauma that she's gone through, you get an extra secret chapter, all washed over with a warm sepia tone as she recalls the good times she spent at the orphanage. The friendships she had, the things the other children used to worry about, and the games they played together. She wanders freely around the orphanage, and is finally able to give an unfiltered assessment of what she's seeing. The rubbish bin no longer talks about its deep belly, able to hold an ocean or cosmos. Jennifer looks at it and remembers hiding her possessions there, because the other children wouldn't think to look somewhere considered dirty. She understands that she was too weak to stand up for herself until it was too late, and regrets it with her whole heart, even though at the time she considered herself the only grown-up, but knows now with hindsight that they were all struggling and that she wasn't above their games. She was a victim of them. She finds resolve and paints a far kinder portrait of her friends, saying that you don't deserve to be forgotten, but I'll remember you, thanking them. Now that she's dealt with all the bad, she gets to remember the good parts too, and choose what she wants to do with that information with fresh resolve. How does she want to remember that time in her life, and where does she want to go from here? And that's clearest when she approaches a mirror in the bathroom, where she asks herself how she feels. That tragedy you wanted to forget. Now that you remember everything, how do you feel? Is the answer inside you? Think carefully, Jennifer. She has all the pieces now. It's up to her to put them together now that she has the full truth and experience of everything she's lived through since. She chooses to keep her most precious memories of her friends close to her heart, and puts the past away, re-examined and understood. 
and I find that really cathartic. Part 2. Emotions It's finished. It's done. You can't take loved away. Now, emotions aren't inherently good or bad. Some people feel that they shouldn't be angry, or should mask sadness with a smile, or perhaps that it's weak to feel frightened. But all of these emotions are there for a reason, and it's to help you survive and deal with what's in front of you. The worst of these for me personally has always been anger. I'm very bad at expressing it, and I don't like other people expressing it either. It's frightening to sit with someone who you know is angry and might lash out. My experiences had meant I'd learned to look at anger purely as a negative. I feared angry people and feared feeling it myself. What if I lost control and acted like that? Did that make me a bad person? What if I hurt someone? But anger isn't inherently destructive, it's just anger. It alerts you that there's a problem, often an injustice being done to you or someone else, and it drives you to do something about that. It's a bodily call to action, and it demands to be heard. It's when you can't actually do anything with that feeling that it becomes a problem, because it festers. Pretending that you're not mad doesn't help because it doesn't resolve the problem or address the very strong feeling that something is wrong or unfair. Many people have an automatic association between anger and violence. And violence is definitely one of the most direct actions you can take, but there are so many other ways to express it. Exercise and sports, art, channeling it into fixing a wider problem via protest, and just talking it out. But it needs to go somewhere, or eventually the pressure will blow a gasket. Or it festers and poisons you. Either way, you're doing damage. It's the same for other negative emotions. Fear lets you know there's a threat and that you need to be careful so that you don't get hurt. It's like a smoke alarm. But where anger can be used as an explosion rather than a tool, fear can also be like an alarm with a faulty sensor, becoming oversensitive or recognising the wrong thing as a threat. Frying an undercooked pancake probably isn't going to burn your house down, but beep beep bitch. And it's the same for positives. Happiness releases serotonin as a chemical reward, and whatever triggered that reward becomes associated with it, so you want to repeat that behaviour. See that person again, do that activity that brings you joy. It's a way to make friends and find things you love. But of course, that mechanism can also lead to addiction and unhealthy relationships if you're depending on one person for your happiness and self-worth. And I'm sure you've heard in a million other video essays that casinos and predatory video game companies create addiction by triggering the dopamine reward system in your brain to trick you into throwing money at them. Which goes to show that any kind of emotion can be unhealthy when it's not regulated. Everything needs to be in balance. In Rule of Rose, one of the aristocrats that Jennifer fears is the cold princess, Eleanor. She acts as a foil to Jennifer, and though she's just as quiet as Jennifer was, she doesn't come across as timid. She's aloof. Disconnected. Despite being the club countess, Eleanor doesn't seem particularly invested in the game. In fact, she doesn't seem invested in anything at all, spending her days dreaming of a new, happy life with her pet bird. She still takes part in every meeting, every group punishment, and cheers along with everyone else, albeit with a bored expression. Even the way that she curtsies turns her face away from whoever she's greeting. She doesn't want to be understood. She wants to be left alone. She's highly ranked partially because Diana, the girl above Eleanor, wants to put distance between herself and Meg, who has an irritatingly puppyish crush on her. But also I'm guessing that the other part of why she's able to maintain such a high rank is because nobody can work out how to hurt her. If she doesn't care about anything, then there's nothing to manipulate or leave her against her. Essentially, she's no fun. We're not given much information on the Cold Princess, because Jennifer can't make sense of her actions or guess at her emotions. Or at least, she couldn't at the time. As an adult, she remembers all of the drawings of the Birdie Town Mare and Land of the Birds the other girls tore up, and finds newspaper articles suggesting that her family fell apart due to money squabbles and likely just abandoned their daughter at the orphanage, rather than her being orphaned due to their deaths. This makes her cold exterior make a lot of sense. She won't let anyone in or display her emotions so that she won't get hurt again. She can't bring herself to care or get attached. In the chapter dedicated to her, Diana and Meg decide to try and coax some kind of reaction from her, and decide to make the bird of happiness the gift of the month, betting on whether Eleanor will cry or get angry when she finds her little bird dead. But she does neither, dropping her treasured friend into the gift box with a neutral expression and walking calmly into another club meeting, as per usual. 
Younger Jennifer tells us that Eleanor was burdened by her own frozen heart. Though she was just as trapped by circumstance as the rest of the children, she leaned into that isolation to spare herself from more pain. That last thread of hope for her, her pet bird, which may have simply been a plushie that her family gave her, a small comfort and tie to her old life, is violently severed, and so she becomes defensively numb. And I'm going to spoil some events of the end of the plot here, but not the far more important why and the events leading up to that, so skip to this timestamp to avoid that. I find Eleanor such an interesting foil because both her and Jennifer have an animal companion. Eleanor has her bird of happiness, and Jennifer has her dog, Brown. Unlike Eleanor, Jennifer grows and changes when she's separated from her own precious friend. She's upset when her dog Brown is missing in one chapter, and is so worried when he's taken from her later that she hallucinates his corpse several times, only to find it was a plushie laid there instead to distress her. The eventual murder of Brown is what finally pushes her to her breaking point, to stand up against the club, violently dethroning the princess, and yelling at the other girls that they're the opposite of aristocrats, and that she hates them, and herself for putting up with them for so long. Losing her friend forces a massive change in Jennifer, and though she's still a gentle person at heart, she values herself so much more afterwards. Brown's death and her inability to stop it is her biggest regret in life. Looking back at her younger self, she feels so much shame for her cowardice, and tells us that I'll never break a promise again. When Eleanor loses her bird, she remains exactly the same. She's static. And while games with a big ensemble cast are going to have static, less important characters that don't need a distracting arc, she does get a distracting arc, which has no outer effect on her. It should be a life-altering event, but nope. Instead of re-evaluating herself, or experiencing a large, visible emotion when the core of her is threatened, Eleanor does nothing. But she does continue to carry around that empty birdcage for the rest of the game. Even if it was just a plushie, that bird clearly meant the world to her. Either she's unable to process that loss, or she's mourning her bird, carrying his memory with her for comfort, or out of an unwillingness to let go. It's impossible to tell from her few words or behaviour. She simply does not acknowledge it. Jennifer can't tell what she's thinking or feeling, and is disturbed by this, so the audience doesn't have much to go on. It's Jennifer's story. If she can't understand, then neither can we. However, in that final chapter, Jennifer remembers Eleanor whispering to herself on the balcony. If only we could fly like birds and go wherever we wished. For all of Jennifer's anxiety, Eleanor was just a little girl dreaming of happier times away from the orphanage. She wanted to follow her red bird of happiness, despite the other girls trying to force the narrative that everlasting happiness is a joke, a weakness to hope for. Whenever you see her in the salon, she's watching her bird calmly, a world map replacing where the large window would have been in the corresponding orphanage room. She wants to leave, to see new places, to be free. She wants to follow her bird of happiness. Whenever Jennifer approaches the bird, it flies away to a different perch, a reflection of happiness being always out of her reach back then. But Eleanor doesn't chase, she watches and waits. I always read this as her pinning her hopes on the future, and knowing that she may be happy one day, but for now she has to dig in her heels and survive. There was still a fluttering heart inside of Eleanor, even if Jennifer couldn't find it at the time, struggling to be heard under the layers of ice. Emotions are often difficult to talk about, as they're both tangible and abstract, but we get to see how another girl copes with an emotional shutdown after moving houses, and how she recovers from it in Disney's Inside Out. Riley is a cheerful, outgoing and boisterous child, who loves sports and has a rich social life. But most of the story takes place inside her head, following two of her main emotions personified, joy and sadness. The emotions are, well, pretty self-explanatory in their roles, and they all work together to help Riley navigate day-to-day -day life. Joy is the head honcho, having most of the control over the inner console, and choosing to make Riley look on the bright side of things. But she also shoos sadness away, and tries to keep her out of the picture. We don't feel sadness here, only happy. Go away. See this little circle I drew for you. But, uh, she still exists? Sadness often tries to feel useful and play her part in Riley's life, but Joy dutifully distracts her every day, literally saying that I'm not actually sure what she does. And I've checked, there's no place for her to go, so she's good, we're good, it's all great. And dismissing her as a purely negative emotion to be kept at bay. 
everything's great as long as Sadness stays away. But during the chaos of the move, Joy is distracted and Sadness touches Riley's core memories, the formative experiences that shape her personality, and she's turning all those happy memories sad. She's tainting them. If she touches a memory, it seems that she contaminates it somehow, and Joy tries to bat her away, but it's too late. A new, sad core memory is made, and the other, previously happy core memories get sucked up a chute, turning off those vital personality islands. The two opposing emotions have to go and retrieve those memories to restore Riley's personality, leaving anger, fear and disgust in control, and Riley is miserable. Even if those emotions try to act like Joy, she can't connect to her core interests anymore. She either feels numb or like one of those more negative emotions still back at the console, and she's never really had to learn to regulate them before, so it's totally overwhelming. Her parents always refer to her as our happy girl, and she feels awful that she can't be that cheerful daughter they've come to expect. It suddenly feels like there's a pressure on her to keep up a front that she doesn't feel, even though she tries for as long as she can. Her parents' jokes fall flat. She cries at school when she tries to talk about the hockey team she loves, because sadness touched that memory. Things that brought her happiness are now reframed as sad, because they're lost. And that's the corruption that sadness is spreading to those core memories. Except, it's not a corruption like Joy thinks it is. It's a reframing. A recontextualizing. And that's kind of a good thing, because it's helping her understand the loss of her home and friends. Of course she's gonna feel sad! But if she doesn't take the time to look at how it makes her feel and figure out how to process it, it's just gonna be waiting there in a little bubble, intruding into her life when she's most vulnerable, and making her more vulnerable to future losses and changes. She won't know how to cope, and it'll make her afraid of change rather than embracing it as something new and exciting like the old Happy Riley did at the beginning of the film. She's framing the move as the worst thing that's ever happened to her, and she's angry and upset about it. Riley's in a new place with no friends to rely on, living in a strange, empty house as the moving van's delayed, so she doesn't even have any familiar objects around her to cling to. No anchors. Her outfits go from colourful to plain black as all of the colour drains from her inner world, her personality islands shaking and beginning to break down as her current experiences go against her formative ones. She has literally been shaken to her core. As her outer normality collapses, so does her inner world. As she has no control and no happiness in her current situation, fear, anger and disgust decide it'll be better to run away and go back to her original home and make new happy core memories where the first ones came from, and plant the idea into Riley's subconscious. They start to panic as they realise the implications of their actions, but that idea is burrowed in their good. And it disables the control console. We're in full shutdown. But that's when Joy learns Sadness's actual purpose. She's there to alert Riley when she's overwhelmed and needs help, urging her to seek comfort from her family and friends. Joy looks at one of those happy, core memories, and Sadness agrees that it's one of the best ones. It's so sad. Joy's confused because, no it's not, it's when Riley got lifted up by her whole hockey team. But Sadness rewinds it a bit past where Joy looked, and remembers that the team did that to make her feel better after missing a crucial goal. She was sitting sadly by herself, but the team reached out to her, not caring about the lost game. They just loved Riley and wanted her to appreciate herself. When they get back to the control room, Joy lets Sadness take over as she wanted to earlier, and that lets Riley let go of the running away plan. She's not running away from her feelings anymore. She's not avoiding them. She's allowing herself to feel sad. And Joy is allowing Sadness to change the framing of the situation. This means that she finally allows herself to break down in front of her parents, and they comfort her, reassuring her that they miss their old home too, but they're all going to be there for each other. Sadness did her job, and now Riley has support. What's the first thing every baby does when it's born? No, really. Think about it. It cries. It asks for help. That's the first skill every human ever learns, to reach out and connect with another person. Everything is new and big and different, but that's okay. There are people here to help. We're all born vulnerable and needing support from the other creatures around us. Needing help isn't weakness, it just means you've got too much to carry right now, and instead of letting yourself get crushed under the weight, you've shared it. And you can take some for someone else when you're stronger. Cooperation is our greatest asset. We're social creatures. All the emotions are there for a reason, and Joy makes the console bigger so all the emotions can take part. 
Core memories are tinted multiple shades to reflect Riley's more complex views on them as she matures. And it's such a good way to get kids to understand that emotions are complicated and all have value, and Riley's inner world grows so much as she learns to incorporate all her feelings. She's a patchwork of all her experiences which shape her personality, but it's her emotions that attach value and weight to those experiences. They're her core. They are her. Part 3. People Aren't Stories Where did you come from? Where are you going? I'm sure you come from someplace I don't know. Going someplace I can't follow. Now, this may seem antithetical to everything I've been talking about, but people are not stories. Life is not a story. Stories are a beautiful way to examine life, to think about what ifs, to consider humanity and fuck about without having to find out the hard way. But life doesn't have neat and tidy chapters or character arcs with a satisfying narrative resolution. You can probably divide up chunks of your life by decades or time spent in whatever town or job, but people are way more fluid and complex than a story can accurately reflect. We're not built to satisfy an audience. At least I hope not. If so, could you guys throw me some popcorn from up there or something? Thanks. Your perspective is always limited to your own experiences. Everything else is secondhand, and that's fine. You just have to remember that it is secondhand, and there's probably a lot of things you'll never experience as fully as someone who's lived it. I will never know what it's like to live as a man, or a person of colour, or an orphan in 1930 in a fucked up orphanage. I don't have those experiences. And while I can imagine the surface, there'll also be things that won't occur to me. There's a lot of internal, unexpressed things and everyday nuances to their reality that I will never know, and that shape their decisions consciously and unconsciously. It's just existence to them, the way that existing as a white, femme-presenting, queer, disabled person is to me. But we all have a lot more in common than we think. Sharing experiences lets you find those common bits of life, and build our own understanding of the world into something a little less of a story, and a little more like reality. Nobody's existence is inherently political, we're just vibing. The problem is, when people start projecting their own narratives onto that existence, and then it goes a bit pear-shaped. If you're worried about how someone else identifies, I need you to know that whatever they're doing, it is not about you. And the narratives you have about yourself probably don't fully line up with the ones people have about you for this reason. You know far more about yourself than any bystander will. You have hidden motivations, things you actively bear in mind, and subconscious biases from your experiences and social conditioning. In a speech given for a conference, author John Green spoke about imagining ourselves and others complexly. He says, Let me tell you what is, in my opinion, the central problem of human existence. I am stuck in my body, in my consciousness, seeing out of my eyes. I'm the only me I ever get to be, and so I'm the only person I can imagine endlessly complexly. That's not the problem, actually. The problem is you. You're so busy taking in your own wondrousness that you can't be bothered to acknowledge mine. All of this is part of why I love the indie hit, What Remains of Edith Finch, which deals with the dangers of fictionalising people and their histories. The game is a walking sim, with Edith traversing her old family home that her mother abruptly removed her from as a child. The house is a monument to legacy. Every time a family member died, Grandma Edie would seal up the person's bedroom and install a peephole to preserve their room like a museum display of their personality. Each has had a hand-painted portrait of their former occupant, and a document, sometimes by them, sometimes in memory of them, on a small shrine which can't be read by an observer unless they find a secret way into the room. It's… kind of morbid? Eventually the house ran out of rooms down the generations, so the house is extension over extension built on top of it, forming a wobbly tower. That's where the young Edith used to live, right at the peak of this family's history. The Finches believed that they were cursed, and became obsessed with death, and the sealed up rooms are a testament to that. They were afraid of losing their loved ones, so they made sure they had a way to keep them with them at home each branch losing all but one of their children, and inevitably losing that final member once they've had a child of their own to continue the curse. And a lot of the Finches die pretty young, the youngest being a baby, his siblings having to share a room with his empty cradle throughout their childhoods. Yeah, if you shared a room, they just cordoned off the bit that the deceased used to sleep in. Memento mori and all that. 
A pair of twins had decorated half their room each to their own taste, until one dies and Edie literally just ropes off half the room. His brother's not allowed to forget, not allowed to move out or look away. Nobody in this house is allowed to ignore what came before them for even a moment. And Edith's mother decides that this is too much, after losing two of her three children, whisking Edith away in the night before her grandmother can interfere. But this means Edith is sheltered from all the history that her mother's been bombarded with her whole life. And she wants to know, she always did. She has a natural curiosity, and Edie wanted to share her family's stories with her, but her mother tore away the memoir made for Edith the night she took her away to try and protect her. Whether the curse is real or not, Edith wants to feel connected to her family, and as the player explores the house, all of the stories we find of the Finches are bizarrely warped memories of themselves. There's barely any straight accounts of these people, more glimmers of the things they dreamed of and wanted to be, but were robbed of the chance. For example, the earliest story is of Molly, a ten-year-old girl who died in the 40s, and her account of a midnight adventure after being sent to bed without dinner. She's extremely hungry, so she eats whatever she can find in her room before shape-shifting into a cat, then a bird, a shark, a sea monster, eating and eating, never satisfied until she smells something irresistible. She follows the delicious scent until her tentacles reach under a little girl's bed, lying in wait, ready to eat her as soon as she stops writing the story down and goes to sleep. It's clear Molly was an imaginative child and loved animals, her portrait featuring her in cat ears and having a pet hamster in her room. But who was this kid? How did she actually die? We don't know. We can guess that she ate something she shouldn't have in her room and died in bed, maybe hallucinating, maybe half waking from a dream, but we can't know for sure. That's all the record we're allowed to witness. There's also Barbara in Molly's generation, the child star who grew up and was frustrated at her work tailing off thanks to her aging out of roles. Her room's decorated with the classic Hollywood signs spelling out her name, and her old movie posters, but her memoir is a horror comic featuring her murder by… a fan club? Boyfriend? Monsters? The only thing left of her is her ear, and Edith will never learn why, but she finds Barbara's music box that her ear was supposedly found in. There's nothing in it now, of course, but Edith comments that her mother never liked her playing with it, and the exaggeration of this into a campy comic feels pretty disrespectful. A cheap, eerie tale to be passed around like a penny dreadful, until you remember that Barbara desperately wanted to be remembered in the media. Would she have approved of becoming a story like this? Her big roles were rolling campy horror films. Again, the player's just left to sit with this, but we know she wanted to be remembered. And now Edith does, for better or worse. Some of the family embraces this as the norm, and Edith said she liked to peek into the rooms every so often and wonder about the people who came before her when she lived there, asking for their stories. And Edie was always happy to oblige, but others tried to hide from the curse. Walter, Barbara's brother, who was in the house when she met her demise and hid under the bed, was so rattled by the loss of his sister that he hid below the house in a bunker, and Edie enabled this by bringing him food for years. He lived by routine to soothe his anxieties, knowing exactly what would come, projecting his fear onto the monster that came roaring past every day at precisely midday. But one day, that doesn't happen. He doesn't know what to do. Is the monster gone? He waits for several days, and each day, nothing. It forces him to realise that he can't keep living the same day over and over, and that actually, he doesn't want to. Whatever curse it was that killed Barbara, it's killing him too while he's still alive, stagnating in a tiny room below the ever-growing house. He says it'll all be worth it, even if he just gets one new day in the sun. And as soon as he sees that light at the end of the tunnel, the monster ends that future, as the train tracks by the bunker have had their recent maintenance finished on them. Poor Walter. But that's the danger in interacting with the world as if it is purely a story, and forming your own ironic twists out of life. It couldn't be helped, it was fated. This was always the plan for my family and my future. Maybe we believed so much in a family curse, we made it real. It embedded this morbid anxiety deep into every family member from birth, and while there's a lot of comfort to be found in honouring the dead and the loved one's memory, you have to live in the present. Edith never gets to meet her family, and lives semi-resigned to the fact that she'll die before she ever meets her baby, going to the house not only to discover the stories that have been kept from her, but to write them down to share them with her child. 
She's seriously unsure whether to pass them down or not, as her family have suffered from knowing, while she suffered from not, but she's paranoid about dying before she can meet her baby. And she's proven entirely correct. The one reading this notebook is her unnamed child, sailing towards the shoreline by the Finch house and leaving flowers on his mother's grave. She died in childbirth. What the future holds for him is a mystery, as we don't get to know him at all. There's no record. He isn't dead yet. But we knew Edith, and her desire to remember her family. But, there's a huge difference between analysing characters and picking them apart, and doing the same to real people. Please, don't expect a nice neat arc or wholesome representation from a real human being. As my love said when I rambled at her about this script, people aren't carrier bags, stop putting ideas in them. And I agree. You can't project your own experiences onto a real person, or view a real person as a metaphor or idea. Making them a symbol is a strange form of living martyrdom, and not viewing them as an autonomous, real, living person. It's a disservice to a human's authenticity. People can't just be one thing, and would you really want them to be? In that John Green speech I mentioned earlier, he says, Inside my body, I see myself in non-literal ways constantly. In fact, it's impossible for me to imagine something so endlessly fascinating and complex as myself without symbol and simile and metaphor. And I think that's the reason why I see myself in all of these stories, and all of these games mean something to me. Each of them break down the idea of how we see ourselves and each other, and how it's impossible to consider the complexities of human existence without narrative or symbol or story. The world is a series of stories we tell ourselves to make sense of the world. We soften some things, and put particular focus on others, according to which memories we want to preserve, and who we want to be going forward. We live according to our values. But we can't forget that we have agency, and we're complex. Give yourself a pen and make notes in the margins. Examine and annotate your heart's contents to your heart's content. Paste in pictures, colour in, write your own future. But don't lose yourself along the way, getting tangled up in what you think you should be. Don't get too caught up in your own head. Take your past and present selves by the hand and consciously step forwards together. Just... be. At the beginning of this video, I said I didn't know how to describe myself, but I think I know who I am now. I don't think it's my place to tell you, though. You've got your own idea of me. I'm a story you've told yourself, as surely as you are your own story. The only question left to answer, and really the only one that ever mattered, is... What happens next?